Inspiring Algorithms. I'm Ben Taylor. I'm Data Robot's Chief AI Evangelist. I'm excited to give you this talk today. So my background has gone all over the place, and I think for some of us in our careers, especially people that have been in data science for a while, this is the reality. We started somewhere else, and we are where we are today because of it. So I started researching Chinese hamster ovary cells. This is part of my chemical engineering foundation where we were working with uh, a biopharmaceutical company figuring out how to scale this um, protein purification process. And during that time, I was introduced to um, computer vision and programming and I fell in love. I, f I fell in love with it because I could see the feedback on the programs I was writing Computer vision is fun, and I did a, an internship with the Desert Research Institute doing satellite image, uh, satellite algae concentration in Antarctic sea ice and building satellite models to accomplish this. And that evolved into grad school where I found myself building models, computer vision models to detect cold nanoparticle arrays and to measure particle statistics around them. And, and these techniques are classical. They did not require some of the newer algorithms that we appreciate today, but it, it gave me a better foundation and appreciation for the power of programming. And my career then finally started by working for Intel and Micron, where I worked for them for five years and applied semiconductor. And there we were building models. We were building process control models, fault detection models, uh, computer vendor computer vision models as well for metrology and I, 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 was, I was really falling in love with uh, high performance computing. I love the idea of big computers working very very hard and I had an opportunity to go and work for a hedge fund where they were building out a 600 GPU cluster for this particular hedge fund. So, so after doing that for a stint I then joined a HR company called HireVue. I was their chief data scientist for four years, learned how to build a data science team, filed IP, and we were able to get a product to market that had AI, AI as a core component. And that ended up being uh, a, a wonderful experience, really enjoyed the team, the executives, a lot of the things that I learned. And, and the, the reason you see this woman here, uh, we one of the memorable models that I remember building was building, helping to assist in building models around flight attendant recruiting and hiring. And after doing this for four years, I got the itch to go do a startup. So I did a startup, co-founded a deep learning and auto ML startup. And, and to kind of wrap up that point there, I like to tell people, I, I know what it feels like to be a junior data scientist where, you, where you're hoping for a shot or for a chance um, to prove yourself in the market. And I know what it feels like to be a data science manager where I'm having to, to deal with hiring and firing data scientists and communicating the value that my team is bringing to executives or people that don't appreciate the space. But after doing a startup, you, you learn one of the most important lessons. So you learn, you learn the lessons around value. So I remember, um, when, so to get to the point, the lesson I remember is when you finally start paying payroll for data scientists out of your personal bank account, your perspective on value changes. The, the urgency is real in a startup and you have to find value. And if you're working on something where I don't see a path to value in 30 days, that is very upsetting for a founder and for someone who's trying to make a business work. So that company, we, we ran that for three years and it joined Data Robot through acquisition a year and a half ago. So now I work in marketing. I run the AI evangelist team. Uh, we still have opportunities to do a lot of technical programming. And kind of we, we live in this world between engineering and marketing. But now kind of moving into the meat of the talk, before we can talk about inspiring algorithms, we need to talk about this concept of intelligence. So intelligence, this is just the your default definition, Intelligence is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge for, for future decisions. I like this definition because it, it's very clear 
and now we can use this to assign what is intelligent and what is not. But the other thing I like about this is now let's take this definition and focus it on the coronavirus. So is this coronavirus intelligent? And if, if you look at a single coronavirus, it, it's kind of hard to argue that it's intelligent because it feels deterministic. I could probably simulate how this might react in a biological soup, and I, and I wouldn't be su surprised by what it's doing. But when you think of coronavirus as a group of coronaviruses all over the world replicating, it actually begins to feel a little bit more gray because as successful coronaviruses are amplified, think of the Delta variant and others, in a way it is capturing its experience in DNA and allowing that to live on. So I'm not advocating to say that the coronavirus is intelligent because most most scientists would say a, a virus is not living and they would argue the other way. But it begins to make you ask important questions. So now going up in the animal kingdom, taking a look at this ant, now we can ask, is this ant intelligent? And I like this photo because the photo is priming your brain to to conclude that it's not, that this ant is not intelligent. Because whatever it's doing, it's going to it's going to quickly die because this is a really bad decision to bite to bite this human ant, which is much bit larger. But now take a look at this. Now these are ants working together, and this is different. This this actually does begin to inspire. And the property that you're seeing here is this emergent property where a single ant is really not that impressive. But when you get a group of ants working together, we now see these emergent behaviors that do speak to intelligence. And a another fun fact, too, is there are algorithms today that are inspired by the hive and swarm behaviors. And so even something like ant foraging behavior has found itself into algorithms that we appreciate today. And to lean into this emergent property, I might say that humans as well are really not that remarkable by themselves. So a single human, if I could go back in time and be reborn where I had no human inter interaction, no interaction with my parents or other humans around me, you might find that I'm that myself or, or yourself going through this would be would be quite quite different. We wouldn't we really wouldn't come across as being very intelligent. And the secret behind human intelligence is really in our experience transfer. Our ability to transfer experience through language, through spoken language and written language, has allowed us to gain momentum and learn from others' mistakes. So we're now at a point where the... And I love this comparison, too, be, between these examples, because going from the Wright brothers to space travel and now the big, bold, ambitious projects that are happening at SpaceX, there's about 70 years between each of these steps. And it's amazing to think that we can go from the Wright brothers to this in that type of time scale. So when you think of experience transfer, this isn't just for humanity, it's also for yourself. So when you're working in a company, you're running a process, you mature on that process, you go from junior to principal level talent, and you're going to see a lot of outliers, you're going to see a lot of edge cases, and that's going to inform you as you as you approach new decision points, going back to that intelligence definition. You'll be more likely to make better decisions based on your experience. But this is also true with all of us working together, if we can transfer this knowledge and transfer this experience. So now inspiration, this is, this is kind of my own forced definition. This is not the Webster Dictionary definition. So when I think of inspiration, I think of inspiration is, is to increase the number of available actions and the potential to act on the new actions. So when I say potential, I mean your motivation. How far are you leading in? How likely are you to go and do this? And I like this photo here. This is actually of the SpaceX super heavy rocket. When you see these examples, when you see Art of the Possible Changing, you imagine more options, you imagine more actions, and if you are motivated enough, your potential to act on those is increased. So inspiration is a very important thing that we can have in the AI industry. 
So something else that has happened in the last 10 years is we have gone from spending 80 to 90% of the work building the systems we care about. And and now that's been flipped. So we spend 80 to 90% of the wor work scoping the problems worth solving because now solving those problems is no longer the bottleneck. And so I, I like to say you are bottlenecked by your creativity. So your ability to think of new problems and to test them, that is the bottleneck. Or your ability to think outside the box and bring other data types into it, that is the bottleneck. Uh, which is really exciting because that puts us into this inflection point where a lot of good things can happen. So I'm going to share a few projects that I've worked on in the past, talk about um, lessons learned, but also talk about kind of some inspirational elements that spilled out of these projects. So three or four years ago, I, I had this idea that I really wanted AI to start playing my Xbox, and that's because I'm, I'm really not very good at it. So compared to your typical seven-year-old first-person shooter um, player, I'm quite, quite bad. And I wanted to build an AI system that could begin to use reinforced learning to begin to play the game automatically. And I was able to figure this out by getting access to what's called a gimmicks adapter. And a gimmicks adapter allowed me to trick the Xbox into thinking it was being controlled by a USB uh, controller when it was actually being controlled by a server. And so when, when I made the connection that this was possible, I, I, called, I had a conversation with Intel, and I told them that I needed their fastest server. I needed something that would allow me to consume this HD video content in real time and to begin building models to act on it. So they, they shipped me the server with 12 terabytes of RAM and 196 cores. And this server lived in my house, which is not something that these servers should ever do. The server was so loud that you could hear it on the third story. And even when I was outside my home, I could hear it whining inside, which made me feel self-conscious with my neighbors. But getting to Art of the Possible, it's amazing to me that uh, essentially a hobbyist can take something like this Xbox problem and begin plumbing it where in a couple of weeks it is now playing itself. And for the record, this project, it never became superhuman, but it did get to the point where it, it was playing. It was able to kill and, and improve its kill ratio over time. And... So, so that was one project that I did a couple of years ago. And, and another one that I, I did recently was we all have fitness routines, right? And we all miss our fitness routines, unless you're David Goggins. Then you will never miss a fitness routine ever, apparently. Um, so I wanted to bring in some outside accountability. If I don't, if I don't do my workout routine today... I don't want to forget to enter that into an app or I, I don't want to have any manual data entry or reminder of that. I just want to have a system that knows what I'm doing and I'm fully accountable to that system. So the, the concept behind this project was can we use video and can we comprehend temporal and spatial flow to know what I am doing in my office at all times. So in my office I have a pull-up bar, I can do sit-ups, I can do push-ups or I can work. And if my home, if my smart home knows what I'm doing, it can now hold me accountable. So if I haven't been working out, it, then it can play noises in the background of my Zoom calls, and that'll motivate me to work out. So, so this is a win-win. Now I have extra accountability, or I'm less likely to miss a fitness routine. The, this other project that happened recently, and we're going to be launching this in the middle of November, so you'll have more information. And, and the video component I'm very excited about. So we did a project with um, NVIDIA and Snowflake where we went out into the Wyoming wilderness and we collected data to teach an AI system to predict if AI, if uh, not AI, if a fish will roll on a particular dry fly cast. And this was a really fun project because it, it, it feels very far away from what you might see as being normal data science. But these are also the types of projects that inspire. They wake people up. They make people think. And if AI is being used on a, a passion sport or something that you're very passionate about, 
it's definitely going to help you help your will start turning on how it could be applied to other elements of your your life, but also how it could be applied to work and in what you do on a weekly basis. Finally, I I don't have examples to show you for this one, but this is one of this this is a project that I'm very excited uh, to start on, and we're starting on this one, where I have three young kids. They always eat in the TV room, and it it bugs the hell out of me. It doesn't matter how many times I tell them not to do it, they still do it. Same with my wife. She tells them not to, they still do it. So I'm working on this AI system now where if my kids eat in the TV room or if the room is just generally messy, it will turn off the Xbox. And if they want to get access to the Xbox, they now need to fix the food violations or they need to begin cleaning. And I think... And this amuses me to no end because I think this is wonderful. So now I just went from being the parent dictator that you must clean, I'm going to yell at you, to ah, clean if you want, I don't really care. And 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 obviously I want to be sensitive to there there are some Black Mirror elements here. Black Mirror being the Netflix show that showcases a lot of the evil AI use cases. So if, if I wanted to be very sensitive to kind of raise any potential problems. If you are using AI to somehow impact the parenting of your kids by removing you as being the typical discipliner, that is now that is now potentially a problem. And it's a problem that we don't really understand because we don't have examples of this. We haven't raised children before where the parents were no longer disciplining them and the home was. We don't know what that would produce. Um, so definitely want to call that out that this, even though this is a fun project and this is a project that I'm doing for me personally, there it will always be some unknowns there about how this impacts humanity as a whole. But as far as uh, a fun project that people lean, lean into, this is one that's had a lot of attention. But what really inspires? So I think inspiration is interesting and purpose is interesting. When you think of building AI models, a lot of times data scientists would think of building them and defending them with accuracies, AUC scores. They'd use some statistical jargon to try to defend what they're doing. And when you think of something like a heartbeat analysis, we all have beating hearts, and a quarter of us will lose our lives due to heart disease. So imagine AI applications that are analyzing every single heartbeat that you have or for any loved ones that you have in the hospital in the ICU, every heartbeat you have is being analyzed and decisions are being made that could save your life, that could delay a disease or a negative outcome. And so when I think of inspiration, I don't think of models that are measured in accuracies and AUCs. I think of models that are measured in human lives impacted. And so th this is a data set and a partnership that I'm very excited about that we started to work on. And finally, key lessons. So, so when it comes to ins inspiring algorithms, I definitely want to throw this back on the audience because the best ideas come from you. So whether it is in your business, whether it's in at home, whether it's a hobby, they're because of where we are with it technology stack. You are not limited. The number of things you can do are very inspiring to me. The number of things you can do around a smart home, swimming pools, kids safety. Um, there's so many things you could do where AI impacts you every day. And, and so to wrap up this talk, I'm going to end with key lessons. So key lessons that I've learned in the industry. Working backwards. This, it's funny how something that's so simple sounds so, it, it, it is very simple. This is common sense, but for people that have been in the AI community for a while, this is not common sense. It is problematic. A lot of times we start with a problem we want to go solve. The AI is the shiny new toy. We're trying to find a place to, to put this potential solution. And it's, it's so important for you to start working backwards. So find the projects worth solving and try to find all the reasons not to start on them and work backwards. So the so working backwards is a huge tip that I think is very useful for people as they go down this journey. The other thing I really like is this concept of small changes. So if, is there a number in your business where a small change leads to a very Im 
very big impact to the business. So think of e-commerce with their click-through rate metrics. Think of insurance with loss prediction. There's there's many of these many projects out there where a small change has a big impact on the business. And if you can find those, then you're going to have the right focus on the types of problems you want to tackle. And lastly, growth bottlenecks. Uh, I think this one's the easiest to communicate is if I'm talking to a potential partner or prospect, I like to say, where's your growth bottleneck by human capital? In this question, if they're not prepared for it, it might be a little confusing or they'll have to think about it more than they should. And so I think the the more straightforward scenario to ask is, if I could gift you a thousand humans today and they're experts, so they're, they're total experts, where would you put them? Assuming you can only be one job family, so it's just one job family, I'm going to gift you a thousand pe- people. Where's your growth bottleneck by human capital? capital. Where are you going to put them? Uh, it's a great question to ask. It really focuses the conversation around value. So final slide, Ben Taylor data. You can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter. I like to joke that if you reach out to me on Twitter, I might respond a month later. I'm not that timely with Twitter. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Q&A and answer any questions that you guys might have on getting value from your data science teams, getting models into production, anything that came up during this presentation, I'm here to answer it for you guys now.